How did the U.S. Supreme Court rule during this 2014-2015 session? Good evening, everyone. I'm Linda Laurel. Welcome to Red, White, and Blue. This was a session for the ages, the U.S. Supreme Court rendering historic decisions on health care and same-sex marriage. The justices also tackled contentious issues ranging from freedom of speech to housing discrimination to redistricting. Tonight, we will break down the cases and the rulings and ask what will be the impact for both the United States and Texas specifically. And can states exempt themselves from particular rulings? To help us navigate this important topic, we are pleased to welcome Professor of Law at South Texas College of Law, Charles Rocky Rhodes, Professor of Law at the University of Houston, Teddy Rave, and Professor of Law at Texas Southern University Thurgood Marshall School of Law, Martin Levy. Leading our discussion, as always, our hosts, David Jones and Gary Pollard. And Ladies. since I'm the senior citizen here today, I guess I should start with Martin, you know, since he's the youngest man on the panel. <laughs> Boy, if I'm the youngest, you're in real trouble if you're the senior citizen, I can tell you that. Martin Levy. Yes. David. We have marriage equality in the United States. Are you happy, sir? Well, I'm sorry to tell you that, given my religious uh, convictions, I'm not able to answer that question. I see. I see. Well, <laughs> <laughs> just teasing. Yeah, we have a very uh, obviously uh, significant decision on really a variety of grounds uh, in terms of uh, the decision concerning uh, marriage equality, essentially uh, pegged uh, by the court as protecting the fundamental right to marry. But the undertone discussed uh, very much in both the majority and dissenting opinions is how do we interpret the Constitution in a majoritarian society? Uh, the majority opinion uh, would be a classic um, expression of the concept that our Constitution is a living and evolving uh, document. The dissenting opinions led um, both by Justice Roberts and Justice uh, Scalia, is that it should not be. Uh, Scalia has said, I don't even mind calling it a dead document, as he argues it should be limited to the original intent. So that's a very significant philosophical undertone to that case, pegged on, um, in the modern era, uh, the uh, court's conclusion that to the right to marry is a fundamental right guaranteed to Americans by the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. Yes, and, and two years ago, the same court said that uh, domestic relations law in the area surrounding marriage is up to the states and not up to the federal government. So what changed in two years besides the court short-circuiting the process, which was an ongoing around the country of legislatures and sometimes referendum where folks have voted to have gay marriage well, in their state? What's if you, changed? If you, first, if you wanted to make your argument, uh, it could even be more poignant by pointing out that when the Constitution was framed, the courts historically held that domestic relations um, is a, uh, an area that is within the province of state governments, not just the decision you were referring to right. two years ago. But that being said, uh, the 14th Amendment is applicable to state governments. And the court concluded um, in Loving versus Virginia and reinforced it several times in Zablocki as well, that uh, marriage uh, and procreation uh, are fundamental rights. And therefore, um, even though the state, uh, states may control domestic relations, um, when it comes to a fundamental right, uh, they can only so regulate if they can prove uh, a compelling purpose. Well, Rocky or, 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 or Ted, was Chief Justice Roberts not taking basically the Ginsburg position about Roe v. Wade saying that it was decided prematurely. Let it evolve to where, because states were becoming more and more uh, 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 pro-abortion in their regulatory schemes and statutes. And then the court jumps in and of course there's this huge backlash that we're suffering from today. Was, is he not in some ways predicting this is premature and we're gonna have another backlash uh, I, I, as you know, the biblical references from presidential candidates are now telling us. I think that's his prediction. I think we'll have to wait and see whether it comes true. And I, this may be just a generational shift, and, and it, it may go away in a couple of years and not prompt the same reaction that we saw with abortion. Except it's created a whole lot of other issues. The first thing that would come to mind, and uh, Rocky, you tell me what you think. Uh, 
Why isn't polygamy legal now under the court's definition of what Professor Levy articulated uh, of the, the basis the majority took here? Well, and that's going to be one of the issues that the court's going to have to deal with in subsequent cases. And some already books, law reviews are being written about trying to make the distinction. And the argument for people who make a distinction is that polygamy causes harms a lot of times in the fact that it's unequal, that the marriage is not of two equal partners. That one, typically you have a husband and you have 10, 11 wives, whatever the case may be, and so that there, it actually harms equality. So that's going to be the potential argument for the distinction. But what if they want to be married? You know, he wants three wives or a woman wants three husbands. What if they want that? Well, that's why so one reason why I, I, th I think that the court in some ways should have pegged this on equality concerns rather than on due process. And Professor Levy's absolutely right with explaining how this came out. But I think Kennedy had some very strong equality arguments that he kind of let go to make his fundamental right to marry. And yeah. uh, so, look, if you... Uh, take a look at uh, the Loving versus Virginia case that we talked about, um, where the court dealt with um, uh, the interracial marriage. Interracial marriage, and, and um, that case really read more like an equal protection decision than a fundamental right decision. Okay, people kind of debated that about Loving. That's kind of Rocky's point, and uh, I think Kennedy could have done that. But to be fair to Roberts. I really think Roberts meant more. I think Roberts' argument was that these issues should be decided by the majoritarian political process, uh, not uh, the Supreme Court. And that's, of course, an ongoing issue in our society. Because yeah, the court is it's essentially it's legislating. Ending. Yes, yeah. Uh, and so we have the Attorney General of Texas saying the same thing right now. Yes, I mean, yes. is anybody paying attention to the Attorney General of Texas, by the way? You are. Uh, you I, said something. I said that I couldn't answer <laughs> yeah. the question. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, no one is listening to him. Anyway. Well, if you read his whole opinion, to be fair to him, I mean, he recognizes the fact that if a county clerk's office, and he, in the understatement of the year, he says if a county clerk's office, if nobody issues same-sex marriage licenses, you're probably going to be subject to a claim. Now, you're going to be, not only are you going to be subject to a claim, you're going to lose that claim, and you may have to pay the other side's attorney's fees and be held in contempt and everything else like that. But most of his opinion letter is dealing with the idea that if you have a particular employee in that office who may have objections, that it would be okay to accommodate that religious objection by shifting responsibilities around in the office. But and I think, you know, in a way, um, uh, that's being too fair because um, the individuals who hold those offices hold them neutrally. They don't hold them privately as individuals. Well, and if I'm we talk, started I'm talking taking, about the whole county court, I mean, if, you're yes, right about the county court. If we started taking but office holders and saying you could decide whether to perform your governmental function based upon your own uh, personal views, um, that's very problematic and probably not workable. And, uh, and I agree with that with respect to the county court, but he mm -hmm. was also talking about the members of the office who are in a little bit different of a position that's, that's having a job. Like having All right, well, let job. me ask uh, Teddy, religious liberty. I mean, the big concern you're hearing from uh, conservatives in the country is that this is really a decision that attacks uh, the, the First Amendment rights to freedom of speech and, and then also freedom of religion for people of faith and that the, the what's and what's behind door number two is Catholic Church you're not going to do gay marriages you're not going to do gay adoptions we're going to take away your tax exempt status that's and that's the fear. that's that's the that's one of the questions that the decision leaves open and Justice Kennedy hints at that in, in saying that this is something that we'll have to work through under our regular sort of First Amendment framework these aren't issues that the court decided at this point so uh, so when, when in the comments made that maybe this is short circuited the process I would suggest to you this is a repeat of Roe versus Wade and 40 years from now, we will still be dealing with the ramifications of this decision and the impact on different rights and clashes of rights that it does, as opposed to letting the political system do it as it should, like we should have done in, in terms of abortion rights, let each state decide what they want to do. And it would all got sorted out, just like this issue would have gotten mm -hmm. sorted out mm -hmm. over time, and the court jump-started and invaded an area, at least in my opinion, because mm -hmm. I... I'm more of a strict constructionist, had no business doing. Well, there were mm -hmm. only 13 states left that, that were, in, you know, that didn't have some sort but, of I, but, but, you know, uh, I think Gary uh, makes a good point. And I, I don't think that future is um, unlikely because um, if you look at uh, the uh, abortion decisions and the circumstances politically since Roe versus Wade, 
it's still a continual battle between the state legislatures trying to use what the court gives them to almost eliminate abortion and the court's continued response to it in the sense of constitutional law. And I think uh, it's entirely possible if we see that type of political reaction that we could uh, see a, a very, very uh, similar scenario. Although, David, you're kind of pointing out that this occurs at the time where the nation's own views on these issues and political views may be uh, close to the court's majority. And well, Danny, I'd like to add like, on, on what Martin's saying here, yeah. there, and yeah. he's absolutely correct, but also to think about, though, too, that this could end up being the next Loving versus Virginia. The, the case, in other words, it, it be, ends up a few years from now, it's not a big deal. So we don't know which route this is going to go right now. Mm -hmm. Is this going to be the Roe versus Wade type thing, or is this going to be Loving versus Virginia, which we don't think about this today, but at the time, this court's decision saying that interracial couples could be married was met with outrage here in the South. And Teddy, my guess is that you're raving uh, <laughs> yeah. about the Supreme Court's decision in the Affordable Care Act. So I'm, I'm playing with your name. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's not funny if you have to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, one, and then that end up being the easiest one of all. You know, six to three, the uh, Chief Justice. So I think it's an instance of the court taking a pragmatic approach rather than a formalist approach. Um, the decision, uh, the, the stakes were actually tremendous in, in the decision. It would have gutted the Affordable Care Act um, if, uh, if states that had not set up their own exchanges could not receive federal subsidies. Um, that, took, that would take away one of the sort of fundamental building blocks of the act, and I think Chief Justice Roberts recognized that in his opinion. Uh, and rather than focusing uh, on the very narrow textual provision uh, that was at issue in the case, he, uh, if you read his opinion, he goes into, this is how the act was supposed to work. We have, uh, we have uh, subsidies, and we have uh, a mandatory requirement that you purchase insurance, uh, and then we have regulation on, on how insurance companies can charge people for insurance. And those three interlocking parts have to, have to all work together. And and he, also said, he also said it was set up to improve health insurance markets, not oh, yeah. destroy them. Well, they're doing a good job of that because insurance rates are exploding. And uh, the good th I guess the, from a political standpoint, now Obamacare is an issue in the next election. And in fact, from a Republican standpoint, if the court had struck down Obamacare, that would have created more problems for Republicans because then you got to come up with answers. Mm -hmm. But now we're going to get all the insurance rate increases and people still don't like Obamacare. Uh, it's, it's a big mess. And I will tell you that Robert's opinion, if you look at it, he takes the position, we need to give, we need to look at what the legislature intended and try to make sure they, they get what they want. I understand that argument. Of course, that's a completely the opposite position the court took in the gay marriage case where they said, I don't care what the legislature did. I don't care what the people voted for. It doesn't matter. We know better. It's so a, it's a sort of interesting hypocrisy. Though, so, so one thing about uh, when, we, when we do these Supreme Court wrap-ups, generally we talk about constitutional rights. Uh, the, the Affordable Care Act decision was not a constitutional case. It was a statutory case. Usually those are the boring ones. This is the, the bread and butter of what the court does and, and what nobody likes to and pay attention to. And did you think that decision, the decision in that was predictable for the Supreme Court after the last decision where uh, Roberts from the majority said that uh, Obamacare is really a tax and that's how we can justify it even though it never was? I think that uh, Roberts's position may be predictable there because it, uh, I think, reflects a consistent approach to statutory interpretation. He's not... Uh, he, he doesn't look at things formalistically uh, and, and look at the narrow, uh, narrow provisions and, and feel bound by the words used. He looks at trying to make the act work as, it was, as Congress intended it to work. Yeah, by, by establishing the intent by looking at uh, congressional intent uh, as a whole, as opposed uh, to specific language, which may not be indicative of such. In fact, Roberts could quote Scalia, who <laughs> vehemently dissented, mm -hmm. could uh, quote Scalia in previous statutory interpretation cases where even Scalia took the pragmatic uh, he's now calling it, He's now calling it SCOTUS care. Well, yeah. and, and not only that, he was actually able even to take a shot at Scalia and saying, you thought this is exactly what this act meant in the last case that we decided mm -hmm. on the Affordable Health Care Act or the Obamacare. In other words, Scalia in his dissent upholding 
the original constitutional challenge had said, oh yeah, these tax credits will be available on federal exchanges as well as states. And Roberts was kind of able to throw that a little bit back in his face in the opinion. So anybody have any idea what's left for these conservatives who uh, apparently do not know how to practice constitutional law? Well, we've got Can uh, <laughs> be objecting? That's nice. uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we should have well <laughs> said, David, I must come. Yeah. Yeah. We, it's not in yeah. the Constitution. This is going to be the term of Texas coming up, and we're going to see we're going to see go cases probably on abortion and on election redistricting from Texas. Mm -hmm. We know that, and we're also going to see uh, affirmative action return. Yeah, we're going to see this affirmative action decision, which may uh, produce uh, uh, a five-four decision uh, from the conservatives. Five to three. Yeah. Well, 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 five to three because Kagan's recused. Uh, well, yeah, it's an affirmative action. Okay, well, I want to talk about, wait, David. <laughs> <laughs> housing. Texas Department of Housing sure. and mm -hmm. Community Affairs versus Inclusive Communities Project. A five to four decision. Uh, anyone want to take a, no, uh, want to explain it? Yeah. The, or I'll uh, do it. It's, <laughs> well, actually. <laughs> but you're the guest. So we want uh, to hear from you. It's <laughs> difficult enough to explain that uh, I didn't see an article in the newspaper actually explain what was being decided. Uh, because uh, we're not deciding um, necessarily how you win or how you lose. The issue is um, plaintiffs in a lawsuit have a burden of proof to meet. It's called a prima facie case. And the question is, um, what do plaintiffs have to prove to make a prima facie case? Of housing discrimination. Uh, in any lawsuit, that's civil suit, that's the right. requirement. Term We're talking case. about housing discrimination. The court has held, when they interpret the 14th Amendment, uh, that you must affirmatively prove um, that the defendants intended to purposefully discriminate, that uh, the impact or effect, statistical effect, showing that minorities were disproportionately affected is only a starting point. They have held that Congress, in enforcing that amendment, can allow disparative impact to make a prima facie case. Title VII, for example. Okay, well, so and that, that's, that was the ruling. Yes. But, but, yeah. in English, yes. but in English, what that means mm -hmm. is you don't have to have discriminatory intent. It just has to be argued there's some discriminatory impact, even though you didn't intend it to be that way. But, Although the, but the, the reason opinion of Kennedy in this situation did tighten that up, because there have been some pretty outlandish claims based on the statistical inferences. And so he tried to make sure that that prima facie case that Martin's talking about, that there's a little bit more than just statistics. Uh, and so we're going to have to see how this plays out going forward. Pretty right. scary, I think. But, but, but the reason it's important. Well, it's been the law this way, though, for yeah. 30 or yeah, 40 years. If Kennedy way, had yeah. gone the other way, he would have been overruling what lower federal courts have been doing since the 1970s. But the reason it's significant, and going through the legal heebie-jeebies, is that even if, um, you can meet the court standard uh, simply uh, by citing to discriminatory effect. That just shifts the burden of proof to defendants. And even if you have great figures showing disparative impact, if the defendants can produce a neutral explanation that is not discriminatory, you may still, the plaintiffs may still lose the, lose the lawsuit. Don't know. Y in I, other words, this doesn't decide uh, the issue, and one of the reasons that's significant is in the law, the hardest thing to prove is somebody's intent. I understand. We had ten major decisions. Well, six not, of them were not, five. Six of them were five to four. The one five to four decision we'll that the conservatives back. won, which is one that we asked Rocky to talk about, was the lethal injection case. They won. That's the one five to four decision okay. that they prevailed on, and with a drug that almost no one is using. Well, there's, so, <laughs> so they, there's, no a, there's a there's a three drug protocol for lethal injection, and the first drug has traditionally been a barbiturate, and so something that would put you to sleep. Uh, but because of both uh, political aspects, pressure by death penalty opponents, uh, and also just some market forces, these barbiturates aren't being made available to prisons anymore to execute uh, condemned killers. And sure. so as a result, uh, they've the prisons have gone to look for another source, and essentially they've used this drug, uh, midozalem, I'm sorry about that, uh, which is a sedative, so it's used for anti-anxiety. Uh, <laughs> and usually, the and they thought, well, if we give you enough, that'll be enough, it'll knock you out. Your anxiety will be gone. Your anxiety will be gone. Only lasts 45 minutes. And, and, and so the question was, the question was, is this new drug, uh, 
okay, is it cruel and unusual to use this new drug? Because there's a risk that the person won't be under for the subsequent two steps of the process. And the Supreme Court, the majority put the burden on the defendant, the, the convicted killer in this case, these cases, to prove that there was not a better alternative rather than to put it on the state to So prove. in other words, he has to stand up uh, and when he, he, he's burning alive well, no, no, according no, no, not, to not the... Not then, but in his <laughs> lawsuit, when he sues, when he sues in his lawsuit, <laughs> so he has later. to identify yeah. Yeah. A, another available drug that would be less, substantially less likely to be cruel and unusual. So the Supreme Court going to, well, you think in the next, probably in Hillary's first term, going to do away with the death penalty? Well, you, think you only have two votes for that right now, and I just don't see that coming to fruition anytime soon with respect to this. If he waits for Hillary's first term, which may never happen. Right. Mm -hmm. We have Breyer, we have, Breyer we have Ginsburg. That's it. That's the only two that said death penalty is... Well, Ginsburg's ready to retire. It's unconstitutional retire. across the board. I mean, so, and, and that's a position that uh, Brennan and Marshall and Blackman used to bring up, but it's never one that's had a majority. And it's kind of hard to square with the text of the Constitution, which in several places talks about death as an appropriate penalty. All right. The only uh, other comment worth making there is that what we might see prospectively is as we've seen changing social mores and norms in terms of same-sex marriage, it does appear nationally that sentiment seems to be, maybe for the first time in our history, shifting against the death penalty. We've had uh, some state legislatures, some politicians uh, make noble moves. And if that trend occurs, then you might uh, uh, see this court uh, so response possible. Yeah, uh, since they want to short circuit uh, social change on a regular basis. Okay, how about EPA versus Michigan? This is where the EPA regulations on coal plants was struck down by the Supreme Court. Of course, the Obama administration has been enforcing it and breaking arms for the last couple of years and virtually killed the coal industry in America, but why should it matter? Well, and my gas is still cheap. And the EPA administrator, <laughs> yeah, that's because of the recession. And the EPA administrator said they're going to ignore the ruling anyway, but because the Obama administration, unlike some Republicans, mm -hmm. not all, uh, they follow the Supreme Court rules, mm -hmm. whether they like them or not, but the Obama administration apparently only follows the one they like. But, you know, the interesting thing about that decision is if you look at uh, the amount of money at stake in this reasonable balancing for the EPA, um, the costs to the... Uh, business entities was in the billions. I think it was 90 billion. The uh, measure against it, if you just looked at finances, was in the millions. So it looked like there's this huge disparity that you're supposed to be balancing. But scientists have asserted that the environment being harmed by that 90 billion uh, caused about 11 thousand premature deaths but can't and prove. suddenly it's not just a money game yeah but it okay. sounds like pop science so let's get let's get into the last right, a couple so. of minutes we've got a, <laughs> we've got the Arizona Commission that decided to redistrict by five appointees mm -hmm. two Republicans two Democrats and then that Six. four shows Six. the fifth yeah. right uh, Robert says correctly uh, I think that why, why, why not use the amendment process to accomplish your objection to partisan gerrymandering? So, so it's an interesting uh, situation. In most states, the state legislature draws both their own districts and the congressional districts. And that creates an obvious conflict of interest there when the legislators are drawing the districts that they're going to run in, and unsurprisingly, they draw them to their own advantage. This has been a problem that's been really, really hard to get at. The legislatures won't fix themselves. Uh, the courts have thrown up their hands saying, we don't know. This, this looks like politics. We don't want to play politics. Uh, and the only way that we've made any progress on this issue uh, is through the popular direct democracy, popular initiatives, where the people themselves amend the state constitutions to take that power out of the hands of the legislatures. And so that's what happened in Arizona, where they set up this commission with uh, two Republicans and two Democrats and one in Which is mostly Western states that have initiative and referendum. Mm -hmm. Not everybody has that. Yeah. And so uh, the, the, the one little problem uh, with this is that the U.S. Constitution says that uh, that, that congressional districts are supposed to be drawn by uh, the states and the legislatures thereof. Uh, and so the question the Supreme Court was tackling there was whether legislature means the actual body that's elected by the people or the legislative process 
uh, of, of the states. And the court went with the latter. They said it's the legislative process uh, that matters. Now, and the, and the important decision, decision coming next term in terms of redistricting is the, the case involving whether voter, we count voters or residents for the purpose of redistricting, which is a very significant case. And uh, if it goes the way I think the court will, which is counting voters only, it'll mean a significant increase in Republicans in the House of Representatives. There in you have another Gary Pollan prediction. <laughs> Thank you. It's <laughs> it's and and, it's, and, it's, and it'll be, it's recorded. And yes, and we could so go. let it be noted. We, we could go back and, and, and find a number of other predictions that you've made. And, oh, I'm consistent. I'd be happy to have I'm positive. Tell us what he really thinks. Go to the videotape, Linda. Go to the videotape. Go to the videotape. Thank you, Linda. Time to wrap it up. Thank you. We'll keep talking. In the meantime, remember you can catch Red, White, and Blue every Friday at 7:30 p.m. right here on. TV8 and again Saturdays at 6 30 p.m. We also invite you to visit us online and send us your comments. We want to hear what you are saying about the issues that affect Houston. You can submit your comments at HoustonPublicMedia.org or on Facebook. And while you're there, don't forget to like us. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you again next week. Good night.